Okay, as you can see, we're going to begin our study of the letter of James, letter, uh, epistle of James. And first, I, always when I'm doing this teaching, it's important that we have some idea of the, of the background. You know, who's writing the letter? Uh, when are they writing it? What is the circumstance? Because, as I often say, we are in one sense reading somebody else's mail. Right? We are reading a letter that James wrote to a group of people, and certainly you know, it is the Spirit of God speaking through James to that group of people, but in another sense it is the Spirit of God speaking through James to the church throughout the ages. But to hear what the Spirit is saying to us, we first have to hear correctly what the Spirit said through James to his immediate audience, and that's just how you go about it. And so it's important always to have some idea of the author. So, so when I talk about introduction things, it's not superfluous. It's not just filler. It's important to get a grip on so we can understand what's being said. Now, the, the author of the letter, it was written by James, a slave of God, and the Lord Jesus Christ. So you have a very minimal identification of the author, just James a servant, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the fact you have such a minimal identification, it indicates that it was a James who was well known in the Christian community. I mean, if he just says James, uh, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, they know who it is. And so it indicates that it's a James who was well known. Now, the most prominent James in the early church was the Lord's brother, James. He was the most prominent James in the early church. And you can just see, for example, a number of texts that indicate his prominence in the early church. Galatians 1.19, I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. Galatians 2.9, James, Peter, and John, those reputed to be pillars, gave me and and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. Acts 12.17, Peter motioned with his hand to them to be quiet and described how the Lord had, had brought him out of prison. Tell James... And the brothers about this, Acts 15, 13, when they finished, James spoke up. Acts 21, 18, the next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James. So you have here this idea, James obviously is a prominent figure in the early church. The Lord's brother, James, he was a respected and beloved figure in the early church, especially among Jewish Christians. He was called the righteous and the just because of his character and his devotion to prayer. So he's well known, he has a great reputation, especially with Jewish Christians. An early, uh, early second century writer named Hegesippus, early second century Christian, he describes James' death in uh, his memoirs. Now we only know of his memoirs through fragments that are quoted by other authors, uh, mainly Eusebius. But this second, early second century Christian, Hegesippus, He claims that James was stoned to death by the scribes and Pharisees for refusing to renounce his commitment to Jesus. And you see that uh, when Eusebius refers to his writings. And the Jewish historian Josephus, he confirms the essentials of that story. And he also allows us to pinpoint the date to A.D. 62. Now there's another James of some prominence in in the early church. James, the son of Zebedee, who was one of the twelve. But he was put to death by Herod Agrippa, you see in in Acts chapter 12, verse 2. He was put to death by Herod Agrippa, and that's around A.D. 44, which is kind of pushing it for whether he could be the author of this letter. Uh, That may be a little bit too early, but even if it's not, there are a number of other reasons or indicators that favor that the James who's well known who authors this letter is James the Lord's brother. One of the things is the fact the Lord's brother was a leader of the church Uh, the early church in Jerusalem, who ministered, this James ministered mainly to Jewish Christians. That makes him the most likely James to write a pastoral, a shepherding letter to Jewish Christians who having scattered from Palestine, as you see, for example, in Acts chapter 11, verse 19, it, it, it makes him the most likely person to write a pastoral letter to Jewish Christians who scattered from Palestine, who were facing economic distress, including persecution at the hands of wealthy landowners. 
And I'm going to develop that a little bit because that's an important part, I think, to understanding what James is talking about in some portions of the letter. Also, this identification that it's James, the Lord's brother, who's writing this, it's further supported by the similarities between the Greek of the letter that we have, the letter of James, and speeches, the, the speeches that we have attributed to James in Acts, and also the letter that was sent out by James to the Gentiles in Acts 15, 23, verse 29. You have interesting parallels here. For example, the word karain, greetings, that word is used in the greeting of James 1, 1 and also in Acts 15, 23. Okay, you, you have that there. It's used there. That's the only other time it's used that way in the New to The only other time you have it used in these two situations as greetings. You have it in James 1.1 1, 1, and you have it when Peter's speaking in Acts 15. That's significant. But the only other time it's used that way is in a letter from Commander Lysias to Governor Felix in Acts 23.26. So we have this uh, fairly rare usage where he opens this thing with greetings. You have the use of names, I have up here bullet pointed, you have the use of name as the subject of a passive form of this verb call upon, epikaleo, call upon, and you have that there, you, you, that, that occurs in the New Testament only in James chapter 2 verse 7 and in Acts 15, 17. So that's kind of an interesting linguistic connection between that James and the James who wrote this letter. You have the appeal, listen my brothers, that occurs in James 2, 5. And in, the, in Acts 15, 13. So again, another linguistic connection there. Now, according to Eusebius, who wrote a history of the church early in the 4th century. Uh, he, actually, there were a number of editions of it. But he completed it uh, around 325 A.D. But he wrote a history of the church. And he says there that the, the letter generally was attributed to James, the Lord's brother. So that's another reason you say, okay... We have minimal identification. Who's the most prominent James? You have these linguistic connections. You have the fact the early church attributed to James, the Lord's brother. All of these things say, okay, we're on the right track. This is a solid conclusion. And here is what uh, two scholars, actually there were three at first, and this is the revised edition of their introduction to the New Testament, and the other fellow, Leon, uh, didn't contribute to this edition, but both editions say the same thing. Carson and Douglas Moo say, we conclude then that James, the brother of the Lord, is the author of the letter. This is the natural implication of the letter's own claims. It is corroborated by the New Testament and early Christian evidence, and it has no decisive argument against it. So James, the Lord's brother, is writing the letter. Now, to whom is he writing it? This is a very important thing if we're going to understand parts of the letter. The scholarly consensus is that the letter was written to Jewish Christians. Okay, Jewish people who have converted to Christ, they are, in, they are the audience, the main audience. You say, well, how do you get to that? Well, there are a number of things that lead people to that conclusion. The first is that James assumes familiarity with and acceptance of the Old Testament in a bunch of places. Now, you see that sometimes, though, in letters written to Gentile churches, so you can't put too much weight on that. Uh, secondly, he refers to their meeting place as a synagogue in chapter 2, verse 2. He addresses them as adulteresses in chapter 4, verse 4. And the significance of that is that assumes a familiarity. It assumes that they're tuned in to the fact the Old Testament uh, likens the Lord's covenant with his people to a marriage relationship. So that's a familiar concept to them. When he, so he can refer to them as adulteresses. He cites the standard... He cites the standard Jewish confession of the oneness of God from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. That's Shema. You know, he cites that. And so that's an indication that he's dealing with people who are, you know, in his wheelhouse, kind of. You see, that they are Jewish Christians, and he addresses them as the 12 tribes of the dispersion, or the diaspora. In chapter 1, verse 1, 12 tribes, that was used by Jews to describe the regathered people of the last days, which for James clearly meant Christians, okay, but he's referring to them as the 12 tribes in the dispersion, and the dispersion was used to denote Christians or to denote Jews living outside of Israel. You can see that, for example, in John chapter 7, verse 35, in the dispersion, in the diaspora. So when you have Jews who are living outside of Israel, 
you have them refer to that that area is called the dispersion but it, that term could be used figuratively for Christians in general who were living away from the, they were living away from their heavenly home and I think that's how Peter uses it in 1 Peter 1:1 1, 1. but this letter this letter is the Jewish atmosphere of it and the probable early date make it likely that the less, the, the reference to diaspora here to the dispersion is more literal He's speaking to Jewish Christians who are dispersed outside of Israel. Okay, he's writing to some people like that who've been dispersed outside of Israel. Now most of the addressees, most of these Jewish Christians outside of Palestine, outside of Israel, they were poor and they were being oppressed by their unbelieving uh, rich neighbors. This is how I see the audience they're Jewish Christians outside of Israel. They are mainly poor, and they are being oppressed by their unbelieving rich neighbors. Let me read you just a number of texts that will pull this out. In, in verses 2 and 3 of chapter 1, he says, Consider it all joy, my brothers, whenever you become involved in various kinds of trials. Okay, so th there, obviously something's going on. Nine, uh, we may get to this today, but I doubt it. But in 9 to 12, it says, Let the lowly brother boast in his high position, but the rich man in his humiliation, for he will pass away like a flower of the grass. For the sun rose with the searing heat and dried the grass, and its flower fell, and the beauty of its appearance perished. So also the rich man will wither away in his pursuits. Blessed is the man who endures a trial, for having been proven, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Chapter 2, verses 5 to 7, listen, my beloved brothers, did not God choose the poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich exploit you? And do they not drag you into courts? Do they not blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? So you get to see this idea of persecution, poor people, rich, wealthy people exploiting them. And taking advantage of them. 2.15 he says if a brother or sister is naked and lacking daily food. You see this idea again. Difficulty, poverty, hardship. 5, 1 to 7. Come now you rich people. Weep and wail over your coming misery. Your riches have rotted and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have rusted and their rust will serve as a testimony against you. will eat your flesh like fire. Look, the wages of the workers who reaped your fields, which have been withheld by you, are crying out, and the cries of those who reaped have reached the ears of the Lord of armies. You lived in a self-indulgent life on the earth and lived luxuriously. You fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You condemned and killed the righteous man. He does not resist you. Be patient then, brothers, until the coming of the Lord." See, so I want you to, you know, I'll talk about all these when we go through, but right now I'm just trying to give you a snapshot of why I think you have Jewish Christians who are outside of Palestine, a pastoral letter being written by James, the Lord's brother, to Christians who are poor and they are being oppressed by their rich, unbelieving neighbors. Okay, that's, that's the audience, I think, and that's very important uh, if you're going to at least understand how I see the letter. Now they perhaps had been scattered from Jerusalem and its confines by persecution such as that described in Acts chapter 11 verse 19. It says, now those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, uh, Cyprus, and Antioch telling the message only to Jews. You see, so here you have people who have been dispersed expelled because of the persecution you have these Jewish Christians and they're trying to establish new lives in new and often hostile environments so here they come they're the new guy on the block not only are they Jews but they're a particular sect of Jews how they'd be perceived that they are this Christian Jewish group and so they're trying to to build a life in this new place Douglas Moo in his commentary on James he says the middle first century, I'm sorry, the middle first century in the Middle East was marred by famine and general economic distress as well as by a tendency for wealthy people to buy up land and force farmers to work their land on their own terms. Now you can see, you know, the idea, uh, rich people exploiting poor people is nothing new. 
You see, this has happened, and you see over and over in the Old Testament, this idea that this is part of what it means to love God, is that you not abuse people who are in a weaker position than you are. You see, that you not take your wealth and your power and you deny them justice because you're a high roller and have access to the judges, that kind of thing. And here you're seeing it playing out in the first century uh, with these Jewish Christians who've been scattered. They were also now, so you have, you have Jewish Christians who are scattered. The addressees, they're poor. They're being oppressed by their unbelieving rich neighbors. But also they were experiencing ethical problems. Okay, you see ethical problems among his audience. The people to whom he's writing, they're experiencing ethical problems in the form of anger, evil speech, favoritism, and various sins of division, all of which may have been related to their oppression and their dislocation. It's easy to understand how these things can crop up in that type of circumstance, but you have them dispersed, you have them undergoing trials, being oppressed by wealthy, unbelieving neighbors, but also in that context you have these ethical problems percolating, and they're going to be addressed, and there's some just powerful uh, ethical teaching uh, in the letter of James. Now, the date, well, when's it written? All right, this is all, you know, these things don't come with dates. I mean, you have to, you try to figure this out. And so one of the key things is that this error of, quote, faith only, this error of faith only salvation that James addresses in chapter 2, verses 14 to 26, this was probably a misrepresentation of Paul's teaching. You see, so you have this, he's probably responding to a misrepresentation of Paul's teaching that had gained some currency and that had been circulated by Paul's opponents or by some people who misunderstood him. And so it looks like he's addressing that, and this requires a date that's late enough for that distortion of Paul's teaching to have reached Jerusalem. Okay, it has to be, the letter has to be late enough for that to have occurred, but early enough that Paul and James had not met to clarify the situation. So that's just a clue, you see. You say, okay, when you're trying to figure out what is the date, if that's right, if 2.14 to 26 is in fact addressing a distortion of Paul's teaching, then the letter uh, cannot be before you have time for Paul's teaching to get distorted and that to come back to the church in Jerusalem. So it has to be at least, it has to be at least that late, and then it has to be a, a, a date that's late enough that the distortion... The distortion has reached Jerusalem, but it has to be early enough that they couldn't have gotten together and said, okay, uh, here's the deal. And then he would be saying, that's not what Paul said. Okay, so now, those kind of are the parameters. Now, you also have, there's no reference to the controversy between the Jews and the Gentiles with regard to the Mosaic Law, which suggests that you probably have a date that's before 48 or 49. Okay, that, that was a 48 or 49 is when that issue forcibly surfaced in the early church. And you have no mention of that. And if that was such a hot, percolating, burning issue, so much so the Council of Jerusalem is probably in A.D. 49. So you would think you'd see some whiff of that in the letter. Now again, can you, you know, is, that, is this mathematical? Can you say, no, you're just, you, you, it's detective work. And so you think, okay, so it looks like it would be before that time. And so when you put things together, it looks like a date of around 45. Okay, A.D. 45 fits. See, Paul began preaching in Syrian Antioch around A.D. 43. So he's preaching there around A.D. 43. Jewish Christians scattered by the persecution following Stephen's death had traveled to Antioch in places around Palestine. Some of them, you see, they could have heard what Paul's teaching or heard some kind of distortion of it, misunderstood it themselves, had his opponents telling them something about it. They could have heard that and then transmitted that misunderstanding to the church in Jerusalem so that when James is sending this letter to shepherd or pastor these Jewish Christians out there, he's made aware of this and he wants to correct that. So he then, that would fit. So 45, I think, will work. James writes the letter, letter to minister to that scattered flock. Okay, so, you know, can, like I say, I think 45 is a good guess. Now, the structure of the letter, this is, this is a crucial thing in my, in my judgment. But I think the structure, it's very important. 
And by structure, I mean, what are you doing? You know, it's the, the flow of thought. It's how do you see the, the train of thought through the letter? And that's, that's an important thing because it influences, right? I mean, this is how you say, oh, no, he's saying this. Now he's addressing this, and he's moving here and there. It's the stream of thinking through the letter. And so that's an important thing. Now, most scholars, many of them anyway, I don't know if most, but many, if not most scholars, they're convinced that the epistle of James is a hodgepodge. You see, a hodgepodge of loosely connected discourses on a variety of subjects. So this is, this is how they see it. A literary mosaic, you see, that lacks the continuity of thought necessary to qualify as a true epistle. It's not a true epistle. It's just a, it's a literary mosaic. It's just a bunch of different isolated things kind of stuck together loosely. And just to give you an example, here is a James Thompson in the Harper, Harper, Harper Bible Dictionary, Harper's Bible Dictionary. Thompson is from Abilene Christian, but he's a, he's a well-known scholar. It says, speaking of James, he says, it is composed primarily of self-contained sections that appear to be connected only loosely by catchwords. Little sequence or development can be detected as the author speaks authoritatively on a variety of subjects. The quote, epistle, is similar in form to such Jewish documents as Proverbs, Ecclesiasticus, and the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs. I disagree with that. You see, in fact, I wrote an article years ago expressing my disagreement with that. And so what I believe is, is the, what's going on is what is represented in the outline that's being passed out to you. I think that this is a coherent pastoral letter that does in fact have a consistent stream of thought through it. And I'll be developing that uh, as we go on. I think it's a coherent pastoral letter that was written to strengthen and to instruct impoverished Christians who were being oppressed by their rich neighbors. This is what he's doing. Okay? And I think it's a coherent pastoral letter. Now, let's, we'll start, and this is, you know, we'll go through the text, and I'll just, we'll read different sections. So here's the greeting. He says, James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. So here we have, he, James refers to himself as, you know, he confesses, implicitly confesses the deity of Jesus by announcing his slavery to both God and Jesus and by employing the terms Lord and Christ in reference to Jesus. He's a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So here you see him implicitly confessing the deity of Christ. By referring to him this way to say, I'm a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, to be a slave of someone was to be their property. It was to be their property. If you're a slave of somebody, you are their property. It's to be subject to their control and, and direction. And in describing himself that way, James is acknowledging his subservient status, status but he's also claiming honor and authority of being a slave of God. He's not just a slave of anybody. He's a slave of God. And so you have both his, his subservient status to God, but also the honor of being a slave of God, a slave of the sovereign of the universe. That's whose I am. A slave of God. Now, in the Old Testament, the title, Slave of Yahweh, that title, Slave of Yahweh, was used of those who came to, an enjoy, to enjoy an especially honored relationship with God. Great leaders of the people of Israel were referred to as a slave of Yahweh. People like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David, and Job. So I think you might be seeing here, when he refers to himself as a slave of God, he's acknowledging his, his subservience to God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, but he's also suggesting his authority to address and admonish them because he is a slave of God. 
And slave of God is somebody who has this relationship if they're picking up this Old Testament, you know, this note. So he's saying, listen, I'm a slave of God. I am going to write and instruct you in that capacity. Now, what blows my mind is that Jesus was his half-brother. I mean, this just, this just is something, you know. We know that at one point, Jesus' brothers, they didn't believe in him. You see that in John chapter 7, verses 3 through 5. They even thought he was out of his mind. Mark chapter 3, verse 20 to 21. And now look at this letter. A slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, what happened? What happened there? Well, 1 Corinthians 15 says, The resurrected Jesus appeared to his brother James. Well, that would do it, wouldn't it? I mean, that would do it. I'm over here. We don't believe him. He's out of his mind. We're sorry. He's an embarrassment. He's gone off the deep end. He has delusions of grandeur. What can we do? All of a sudden, slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, what happened? That's what I say. He saw his dead half-brother alive again. And you weren't going to convince him, you know, you know, this stuff about, well, he was dreaming, all this stuff. You tell that to James. <laughs> James understood he had seen his brother living. He knew the difference. You know, we, you know those old stupid people? They were so gullible and stupid in their superstitions and all. They wouldn't know the difference between a thought, a dream, a spirit, or a person. Oh, they would. <laughs> they were people, you know. They were people. And they understood this. And when he saw Jesus back from the dead, he said, Whoop! that's his mind I'm pulling inside out. He said, okay, you see, this is a different thing. I've misunderstood this, misconstrued this. Now, according to Josephus, in A.D. 62, Jesus' brother James was put to death at the instigation of the Jewish high priest Ananus for supposedly having transgressed the law. Okay, that, uh, charges that Hegesippus, that early 2nd century Jewish, I mean 2nd century Christian writer, he says, he makes clear they were, those charges were related to James' faith in Christ. That's what led to his death. And so not only is he saying here in this letter, look, I'm a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, he died for that conviction. Now what would it take to turn a skeptic into somebody like that and you have the resurrection appearances that's why see I'm a big person about the resurrection I think the resurrection is a fundamental pivotal thing that people have to address and that the world has no answer for it they just have smoke for it Amen. okay and that's why a while back we went through a long thing where I, I did lessons on that and uh, that's part of what motivates that okay so here we have the greeting and then if you look on the outline, what I think happens is James is now going to give them encouragement and instructions for trial from chapter 1, verse 2, down to chapter 2, verse 13. And the first section of that encouragement and instruction for trials is in, chap is in chap chapter 1, verses 2 to 12, where he's going to give them encouragement to endure this oppression they are experiencing at the hands of rich people, rich unbelievers. So what I think he's doing, he's in giving them, encouraging them to endure this oppression, and he does that first by telling them in verses 2 to 4 about the maturing effect of trials. He wants to strengthen them. He wants to encourage them because they're being oppressed, persecuted by these rich unbelievers, and he wants to do that by saying, listen, there is a benefit to what you endure. He says in 1, 2 to 4, consider it all joy, my brothers. Whenever you become involved in various kinds of trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance complete its work so that you may be complete and whole, lacking nothing. You see, what he's doing here, as I say, he's encouraging them in the circumstance they find, in which they find themselves, encouraging them to endure this oppression by the rich, the oppression they were undergoing, he's telling them. This oppression that you're experiencing this was something, you see, that was a faith test. Because he says, consider it all joys whenever you become involved in various kinds of trials, because you know that the testing of your faith, 
So these trials, they're a faith test of some kind, and that is because they were either religiously motivated in that people said, listen, who are these people? You see, we're, we're not going to help them. Perhaps the Jews who were out there who didn't like that they believed in Jesus refused to help them and shun them and left them out uh, you know, at, at the mercy of the world. So it could have been this. I, it could be a faith test in that sense in that there was a, a religious motivation to the persecution and or it could be that they perceived these difficulties and oppression as a sign of God's disfavor with their faith. You see how, how that would be tempting? If I'm a Jew and I'm now believing that Jesus is the Messiah and I'm getting the hammer, you can see me thinking, well, maybe I'm getting the hammer because God is telling me he disapproves of my faith. You see, so it puts in play the question of faith. That's why it's a faith test. It is, t- it is something that, well, James encourages them to endure the trials by reminding of the spiritual benefits that accompany such trials. They're a kind of spiritual aerobics. That's how to look at these things. They're a kind of spiritual aerobics. Though they are hard to undergo, they produce something of greater value than the pain they cause. Namely, they produce spiritual maturity. While you're enduring this, while you're getting beat and hammered, what is happening? You're becoming stronger. Now, does that mean it's a yawner to go through? Of course not. It's difficult. It can be brutal. But he's encouraging them to do this by saying, look, there is a positive benefit of what's happening to you. There is this maturing effect of your going through trials. See, with that perspective, you should rejoice when they come. Why? Because I understand I'm getting a workout. Not that I ever work out, so don't. (laughs) Nobody get that idea. You see. I'm getting a, you you see, that's the idea. So I see that there is something, a higher blessing to be received from enduring these difficulties and this hardship. See, it's an opportunity for growth. And this isn't unique to James. Here's Hebrews chapter 12, kind of small print there. But the writer there says, endure trials for the sake of discipline. God is treating you as sons, Hebrews 12, 7 to 11. For what son is there whom a father does not discipline? But if you're without discipline, of which all have become sharers, then you're illegitimate and not sons. Moreover, we had the fathers of our flesh as correctors and we respected them. Should we not much more subject ourselves to the Father of the Spirit so that we will live? For they indeed disciplined us for a few days according to what seemed good to them, but he disciplines us for our benefit in order for us to share in his holiness. But all discipline for the moment does not seem to be pleasant but painful, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Now that doesn't mean that we ever get to say to anybody who's enduring difficulties, enduring persecution, enduring oppression, enduring hardship, to sit here and say, hey, it's no big deal. You know, don't worry about it. It's all for your spiritual maturity. Don't worry about it. You cannot make light of the pain. What What he's trying to do is give them a perspective that will help them through the pain. You see, that's what he's trying to do. He's not, you know, sneering at their pain and difficulty. He's trying to give them a perspective that will give them the strength to endure what they're going through. I remember in the early 90s, this lady Carol Potter, she was an actress, played in Beverly Hills 90210. She talks about how in in July of 1985, she turned her life over to to God. And that thereafter, she met this man and they had this, you know, uh, he proposed to her four months later. They got married uh, life was just wonderful. Then a year or two after that, they had their son. And she said, on the top of the world, everything was absolutely wonderful. And then six weeks later, he was dead of lung cancer. And so she wrote in that, in that uh, parade magazine, speaking of that uh, agony of that experience, she says, going through Spencer's death with him in the morning that followed is the biggest gift I've ever received It made me more fully human. It opened my compassion for others. This is the idea, you see, that hardships in these things, that if you can hold on to the idea that though I am struggling and suffering and crying and in pain, that God is at work 
to bless you through them. And he wants them because they're, they're being oppressed. He's saying, listen, I want you to see there's a maturing effect here. So that as you're getting the hammer, allow that to give you the strength to endure it and not simply be crushed by it. And I think that's important. Then he says in, in, verses, in, in chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, he's going to tell them. He's, he's encouraging them uh, here to give them strength to withstand the oppression and the difficulties. He tells them first, look, there is a maturing effect that is at work here. But then he also tells them, look, there is the availability of the wisdom that you need in these times. He says, but if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives to all without reservation and without reprimanding, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, doubting nothing, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he'll receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. You see, trials magnify a person's need for wisdom. Difficulty, suffering, being under pressure, they magnify the need for wisdom. The pain makes it hard to recognize the right course to take. When I'm being oppressed, when I'm being beaten, it's hard for me to see the right course. See, under the pressure of hardship, the sinful way can sometimes seem like the best way. Right? Isn't that part of the temptation I'm being pressured? So, no, I think, let me think about this. I think the way out of this is for me to recant. I think the way out of this is for me to lie about something. I think the way out of this is for me to go steal something. You see, it, it blurs your vision. It makes it difficult. So it increases the need for wisdom. In addition, one needs wisdom to recognize and appreciate what he just said in the previous verses, that God is in fact working through the trial. It's hard to see that through tears. It's hard, you, I, you come and say that. It's hard to really see it. They just become words. Empty, hollow words. And there's a difference, you see between internalizing what he's telling you about this idea that these difficulties, that there is a spiritual benefit and blessing to them. And so wisdom is needed not only for a person to discern the right path and the right course when hardships are pulling him over here to make the wrong seem right, but also wisdom is needed for you to really internalize and grasp that God is at work in these difficulties. Ralph Martin says in his commentary, he says, the reader's are facing some real problems arising from persecution, and it is the gift and application of wisdom to see these trials in their proper light and respond accordingly. So you see, I think there's a, just as an example, there's a clear flow in what he's telling them. He's giving them this lesson. He's encouraging them and instructing them in trials. He's encouraging here, giving them encouragement to endure the oppression of the rich. He does that. He says, look, do it because you see there's a maturing effect of these trials. And then he lets them know there is the availability of the wisdom that is needed in times of trials. So endure them because that wisdom is available. James encourages his readers to endure those trials by promising that the wisdom needed during those times is available from God for the asking. Okay, God not only gives without reservation, which means he gives generously. He not only does that, he also gives without scolding us for not already having the wisdom we need. So he says he gives without reservation and without reprimanding. So you don't have to sit here and go, well, can I ask for wisdom? I probably should have a better grip on this by now, and he'll be upset with me. He says he gives generously, without reservation, and he gives without scolding, without reprimanding. What are you doing here? Why are you asking me for this? How old are you? You don't have to worry about that. You see, you don't have to worry about that. He tells them that he gives that way. So there should be no hesitation in asking for this wisdom. And with wisdom, they're able to see sin for what it is, and to be able to discern the right course to take. To sit here and say, no, I'm, I'm with God and this is what God has revealed. This is the right path. I, I'm pulled over here to do this, but no, no, I see 
the will of God, this is the way to go. This is what will honor him. This is what will bring him glory. This is more important than whatever I'm enduring. And it will give you the ability to see that and to understand that. And they'll also be able to grasp this idea that God is in fact at work in this for your benefit. You're not alone. He hasn't abandoned you and turned his back on you so that he's sitting there saying, here you go, he is with you in it. He is working in it for your glory. He has not turned you loose. He has not abandoned you. Now he cautions, however, that this asking must be done in faith. He says the one who, quote, doubts will will not receive anything. And the word that's translated there, doubting or doubts, it means dispute with oneself. In the middle voice here, which it is, it means dispute with oneself. And as Douglas Moo says, as the word's basic meaning suggests, James is probably thinking of a strong kind of doubting, a basic division within the believer that brings about wavering and inconsistency of attitude toward God. In other words, he's probably not saying, he's probably not saying that a prayer request, whether it be for wisdom or anything else, will be granted only to one who is metaphysically certain that it'll be granted. In other words, for one who harbors any questions or uncertainty about what is God's will in this particular instance. You see, that if, I, that if I wonder, is it God's will in this particular case for him to grant me something, if that thought crosses my mind, I'm doomed because I'm not metaphysically certain that it will happen. He's not talking about that. You see, he's not talking about, he, he's saying it won't be granted to one who is divided in his allegiance to God. One who is a spiritual schizophrenic, if we even use that term anymore. He's a, if I could call, recall the other thing, spiritual something. Split personality, I don't know. What do they call it? Bipolar, okay. All right, now this is, this is confirmed. See, this idea is confirmed in verses 6 through 8 where the doubter is portrayed as a wave driven and tossed by the wind and is labeled a double-minded man who's unstable in all he does. See, this strong sense of doubting is confirmed when you look at this. And what does he say? The image of a wave blown about, it's taken from Jewish tradition. You can see it in writers like the first century Jewish writer Philo. This idea of the wave toss. And Moo says the picture here is not of a wave mounting in height and crashing to shore. This kind of directive, purposeful wave. That's not what it's about. He says, but of the swell of the sea never having the same texture and shape from moment to moment, but always changing with the variation in wind and direction. It's a double-minded, a double-souled person. You see, that's the kind of, of, of person he's talking about. And I heard that bell, and I'll pick up here next week, Lord willing. Thank you.